The 29th of May, 1914. The Empress of Ireland was outbound the St. Lawrence River, traveling from Quebec City, Canada, to Liverpool, England. Departing Quebec at about 4 p.m. the previous day, none of the 1,500 passengers and crew on board had any clue that in less than 12 hours, two-thirds of their numbers would be dead. Following a sudden collision and a horrifically fast capsizing that would render the safety revisions that followed the Titanic disaster completely worthless. The story of the Empress of Ireland actually begins with the story of the ambitious Canadian Pacific Railway Company, an ambitious group of entrepreneurs meeting in the 1880s with the plan of building a railway from Atlantic to the Pacific, uniting the massive and wild young country. But their ambitions didn't end with their rail line, which was completed in a staggering 10 years. The success of the railroad was simply step one. Those in charge of CPR saw the burgeoning business of immigration from Europe, as well as steamship freight as the next logical and fruitful step. The promise of being able to ship mail and freight from Europe across Canada by rail, then all the way to Asia by steamship was ambitious, but also lucrative. The purchase of several outdated Cunard Line ships started the line. A government grant of several miles of territory in British Columbia started the port that would be the jumping off point to Asia, this port later known as Vancouver. Finally, a Royal Mail subsidy was awarded to the company in 1889. CPR would move mail from the UK to Halifax, Nova Scotia, then by rail from Nova Scotia to Vancouver, then by steamship to Yokohama, Shanghai, then finally to Hong Kong. It was expected to take no more than 28.5 days. With this subsidy secured, CPR formed contracts for the construction of three 6,000 ton steamers, the Empress of India, the Empress of China, and the Empress of Japan. The three vessels were around 485 feet long and capable of carrying about 3,000 tons of cargo and about 900 people. They weren't pretty, being cargo steamers first and foremost, but they could achieve greater than 16 knots and made the trip from Vancouver to Asia in a very timely manner. With Canada growing and burgeoning into a larger nation, immigration to the country was reaching an all-time high. The need for larger passenger steamers from Europe to North America was being realized by the CPR line. In December of 1904, an order was placed with the Fairfield Shipbuilding and Engineering Company for two 20-knot, 14,500-ton liners. The vessels would be laid down as hull 442 and 443, and cost the company 375,000 pounds each. The keel for hull 443 was laid out in berth number four of the Fairfield Shipbuilding and Engineering Company shipbuilding yard on the 10th of April, 1905, right next to her sister ship. The twin vessels were 548 feet and nine inches, or 176 meters in length, and 65 feet 7 inches or 20 meters at the beam. From keel to top deck she was 87 feet or 26 meters with about a 27 foot or 8 meter draft. At the time several transatlantic steamers were being fitted with steam turbine engines. Large 400 foot steamers were now able to achieve a blistering 25 knot speed. But the designers for the Empresses were fearful that such new designs might ramp up costs on maintenance. Instead, they settled for twin quadruple expansion steam engines, connected to two screws. They could move the large steamers along at a slower but more reliable 19.75 knots, even breaking 20 knots in sea trials. While there were vessels that could make the transatlantic trip faster, CPR touted only a four-day open sea trip, meaning only four days were in the open ocean as opposed to the five or six days of the trip to New York. While the total trip was around six or seven days, the last few were in the St. Lawrence River and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Fairfield Shipbuilding excelled at a great many things, but one of the biggest was their incredible woodworking. While the hull was, of course, of steel construction, the superstructure and elegant interiors were made of the finest woods. Over 20 types of wood were imported to the 20,000 square foot mill at Fairfield. Everything that could be was made of solid wood. Whatever couldn't be received a wood veneer. Rich mahogany, satin wood, alder wood, maple, and oak, the interior of wood fashioned to reflect the vast and beautiful natural splendor that was Canada, from beautiful oak and walnut cabinetry to sturdy teak decking. 
The ship had eight decks in total, featuring housing for all four classes of passengers, 270 in steerage, 494 in third class, 468 in second class, and 310 in first class. Each class had their own social halls, dining halls, and smoking rooms. There were children's nurseries, saloons, libraries, cafes, and three different promenade decks. The Empresses were just as beautiful and elegant as any other contemporary ocean liner plying the Atlantic at the time. In terms of safety, the Empress was ahead of her time. She had a 1.5 kilowatt Marconi transmitter, receiver, and emergency set. The ship itself was split into 10 transverse watertight bulkheads, fitted with a series of watertight doors forming 11 watertight compartments. Their watertight integrity extended all the way up to the main deck. The distance from bulkhead to bulkhead varied, being anywhere from 22 to 87 feet. But it was believed that if any two compartments flooded, the ship would stay afloat. Openings in these bulkheads were sealed with horizontal or vertically closing watertight doors. There were 24 watertight doors in total that needed to be closed manually. In the event of an emergency, stewards would crank the door shut manually to stop any progressive flooding. This took a steward about one minute to do. While the technology existed to make these doors close automatically, it's unknown why CPR didn't install it on the Empress classes. In her original configuration, much like the Titanic, the Empress of Ireland was outfitted with life-saving equipment in accordance with regulations set down by the Board of Trade, which of course meant not enough lifeboats to fit everyone on board. The original outfitting had featured 16 steel lifeboats built by the Seamless Steel Boat Company, attached to davits on each side. There were also four additional collapsible wooden berth-on boats. If all of these boats were successfully launched to capacity, it would account for 940 lives saved. A little more than half of the passengers and crew. As for life belts, she carried a total of 1,770 adult and 150 youth life belts. Just barely enough for each passenger and crew member to have one, if they were lucky. But after new regulations came into effect in January of 1913, following the Titanic disaster, the ship was completely refitted as far as her life-saving equipment was concerned. All the davits were then extended to house an additional 16 Engelhard collapsible wooden lifeboats, with an additional four added to the lower promenade deck. This essentially doubled the lifeboat capacity on board to around 1,860 people. Additional life belts were also taken on board, amounting to around 2,100 in total. The ship derived her power from two massive boiler rooms. They created steam to power the two quadruple expansion steam engines. Each engine weighed an amazing 540 tons. The space that housed them was 71 feet long, 65 feet wide, and 30 feet high. They could pump out an incredible 18,500 horsepower. The Empress of Ireland entered the water on the afternoon of the 27th of January, 1906, christened by Miss Alexander Gracie, wife of Fairfield's managing director. The ship slid down a 928-foot launch into the River Clyde. She spent the next few months having the final touches put on her before starting sea trials on the 5th of June the same year. Her maiden voyage was on the 29th of June, 1906. Departing Liverpool on Friday at 6.30 p.m., she crossed the Atlantic for the first time, bound for Quebec. Poor weather for two of the days prevented the trip from being a record breaker, but subsequent trips would prove to be faster, setting records for the line. Traveling 2,623 nautical miles, she arrived near Father Point and took on customs and immigration officials. They would begin inspections of the ship as she traversed the St. Lawrence River. The Empress completed her maiden voyage as she pulled into Quebec on the 7th of July, just after 5 a.m., greeted by a crowd of well-wishers. In full dress ship, she flew flags from bow to stern. On her bow, she featured the Irish flag, the Union Jack on a green field with the Golden Harp of Erin. This was to honor her namesake country. Passengers enjoyed a breakfast in the salons as stevedores unloaded their bags. They caught the first 9 a.m. CPR train, starting the next leg of their journey. The return trip back to Liverpool departed on the 12th of July. To commemorate the eastbound crossing, the Irish citizens of Liverpool presented the Empress with an assortment of silk flags, to be flown as she sailed into Liverpool. It wasn't until her third crossing that the ship set a Canadian record for the fastest crossing, reaching Father Point in 5 days, 10 hours, and 30 minutes. 
The crossing to Father Point being the most important due to it being the drop-off point for mail, the most important moneymaker for the RMS ships. The ship had a mostly uneventful career for much of its life after this point, with a few rare exceptions, one of which was on one of the ship's westbound crossings. On the 8th of October, 1909, the ship departed Liverpool. By the 14th of October, the ship had completed its open ocean phase and entered the St. Lawrence to complete her trip. The ship passed Cape Chat, around 290 miles from Quebec. At around 11.40 a.m., the ship came to a sudden and abrupt halt, jostling all on board. Heavy grinding and the scrapes of metal could be heard all along the port side, in spite of the fact that she was more than two miles from shore. After a quick inspection, the chief engineer reported 20 to 30 feet of water in the forward stokehold, but the damage seemed to be minimal and wasn't progressively flooding. The ship continued on to Quebec to offload her passengers and cargo. Divers would be sent down to investigate the damage whilst in Quebec, but were delayed as a massive fire broke out on the Quebec waterfront, entirely unrelated to the Empress at all. The ship had to be quickly unmoored and moved away as flames licked at her side, the ship coming away mostly unscathed. The same couldn't be said for the Quebec waterfront, which received roughly 1.25 million dollars in damages, and one firefighter lost their life. The investigation was hampered by two days as the diver's equipment was destroyed by the fire. But once they were able to investigate, a 15-inch wide crescent-shaped hole was found in the underside of the Empress of Ireland. She was patched up using cement and brought back to Liverpool for dry dock. Further inspections found damage all along the port side. Numerous strakes were scraped, rivets sheared off, and there were chips taken out of the tips of two of their propeller blades. A board of inquiry was convened, but after a bit of deliberation, the navigation team was found to be not at fault. No solid answer was reached for the cause of the damage, but best guesses place it as being a waterlogged underwater derelict, probably held in suspension. The ship's final fateful voyage began on the 28th of May, 1914. She departed Quebec City at 4.30 local time bound, of course, for Liverpool, England. At the command of the vessel was 40-year-old Captain Henry George Kendall. Though this was Kendall's first time commanding the Empress of Ireland down the St. Lawrence River, he was far from an inexperienced mariner. Born in 1874 in the borough of Chelsea, he wasn't born into a seafarer's family, but he did choose the life at the age of 15, joining the crew of the city of Berlin. The three-masted single-funnel bark ran from Liverpool to New York, giving the young man a taste of transatlantic travel. He bounced around from ship to ship, sailing around Africa to Australia and all throughout the Pacific, working his way up the chain of command. His career rather colorful and befitting a video all of his own, having a brush with death when he observed a shipmate murder another in cold blood and having to jump ship in Australia to avoid becoming the man's next victim. While in command of the SS Montrose in 1909, Kendall even became instrumental in the arrest of an infamous high-profile murderer. A man by the name of Dr. Holly Harvey Crippen was fleeing England after murdering his adulterous wife, chopping up her body, and attempting to dispose of it by dissolving it in his basement. He and his new spouse boarded the SS Montrose, disguised and bound for New York to attempt to start a new life. The shrewd-eyed captain soon realized something was amiss when he spotted the disguised doctor holding hands with his wife on the promenade deck when they suspected none were looking. Nothing too suspicious there, of course, other than the fact that Crippen was posing as a reverend and his wife Ethel was disguised as his son. Seeing the two holding hands obviously raised several questions. Kendall invited the two to dine at the captain's table during their trip goading out information from the disguised Crippen, only further confirming his suspicions that the man was not as he seemed. Kendall was then able to call back to the UK on the Montrose's Marconi device. He informed them that he believed the London basement murderer was aboard his ship, bound for London. Scotland Yard responding by sending a detective over to overtake the Montrose on a faster steamship and arrest Crippen as he departed in New York. Kendall's tale is a fascinating one, and if you ever get the chance, I highly recommend reading about his life. He was an experienced mariner that led a very interesting life. You won't be disappointed, trust me. 
Before departing Quebec, the Empress would spend seven days unloading 2,600 tons of coal into her bunkers and 1,100 tons of cargo. Meanwhile, the day of her departure, she took on 1,057 passengers, 714 which were steerage and third-class passengers. She sat at about two-thirds of her maximum capacity, her second and first-class accommodations a bit lighter on this eastbound crossing. But her passengers were varied from all walks of life. Most notably to all on board were the 171 members of the Salvation Army. They piled on board, coming from all corners of Canada, to attend a convention being held in the UK. As the Empress pushed away from the pier, it was to the sound of God be with you till we meet again, played by the Salvation Army band. The passengers went off about their business at this point, able to enjoy their, the evening meal shortly after and become acquainted with their new temporary home for the next few days, walking the promenade decks, exploring the lounges and smoking rooms. During the day it was a clear and warm May day on the St. Lawrence, but as night eventually fell, a brisk chill would spread over the exterior decks. Many retreated inside, but still kept portholes open to the outside air. The boilers in the ship kept the inner cabins quite toasty, and the portholes offering a pleasant contrasting breeze. On the bridge, Captain Kendall would not be doing his first outbound transit alone. He of course had his bridge team, which consisted of a helmsman and at least two quartermasters at all time. As per regulation, there was additionally a pilot on board for the transit. But the night was pleasant, visibility was decent in the dark, and navigation was unimpeded. The only real issue was the intermittent fog banks that haunted the St. Lawrence this time of year. Coming on as steadily growing thick blankets or rolling across the river in heavy banks that arrive out of the blue, before just as suddenly rolling away into the night. Standing orders had the ship reducing speed in fog then signaling her whistle as she enters, and in intervals of two minutes, then signaling as she leaves. Stewards were additionally assigned to go about the weather decks and close portholes as they enter the fog as well. A bit after midnight, the Empress of Ireland entered one such fog bank. She sounded her whistle and stewards turned two, closing portholes on the weather decks. But the bank, as thick as it was, was short-lived, peeking out on the other side soon after, unscathed. As the ship neared Ramowski at about midnight 30, she was greeted by the Royal Mail mail tender, dropping off several satchels of mail for the crossing to the UK. Continuing on, the ship neared Father Point, where the river starts to widen significantly. It was around 30 miles across at this point, and it opens out into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and then further into the Atlantic. At around 0120 AM, the ship slowed down as the pilot boat neared to drop off the pilot and allow the Empress of Ireland to steam seaward and off across the Atlantic. At 0130, the pilot was off. The vessel was ordered ahead at about 15 knots, taking a course of 050 to the northeast, out away from shore and towards the center of the river. By this time, most of the passengers had gone to bed, with the exception of the most insomniac patrons of the bars and smoking lounges. The decks of the ship were quiet, the only sounds being the steady thrum of the engines and the gentle lapping of the calm seas against the hull of the ship. Not long after, at about 0136, the lookout rang his bell from atop the crow's nest, announcing he had spotted a light off to starboard, but reported it had become obscured shortly after. This was a possible indication of fog. The decision was made to summon Captain Kendall to the bridge, but before that could be done, the man himself arrived, as if by instinct. Not two minutes after, the lookout called down again, saying he spotted a new object, three to four points off starboard, or about 40 degrees. Sighting in on the object, it was clear it was another steamer, approaching at a steady clip. The Empress at this time was going about 10 knots. It was unknown how fast the other was going. The distance was estimated to be about six nautical miles. The captain made the decision to continue his track across the St. Lawrence, porting his helm to make him two points more to the right, towards the oncoming ship, to a course of around 075 degrees. To ensure he had made the right call, he climbed up to the navigation flybridge and took a bearing to the approaching steamer, holding him at about 087 degrees, nearly directly starboard. He also remembered seeing a starboard side light, indicating the vessel would pass them on their starboard side well out of the way. The other vessel, unbeknownst to Kendall, was the Norwegian collier, the SS Storstad. The vessel was 440 feet long, or 134 meters, and 58 feet, or 17 meters, at the beam. She was a little less than half the Empress's displacement at 6,000 tons, 
although at the time she was loaded with around 10,000 tons of coal, now rivaling the Empress in displacement. At the command of the Collier was 33-year-old Alfred Severing Gensen Toftens. The tall Norwegian man had had his master's certificate for around seven years now. He had been on board Storstad for about three years, rising from third officer to first officer at that time. He was an experienced mariner in every right. But his story did not align with that of Kendall's. He observed the Empress of Ireland to his port by about two points, or around 20 degrees. Then, as he watched, the Empress's bow swung from starboard to port, the ship seemingly making a drastic change to port in front of him. Toftens now assumed the vessel would be passing port to port, while Kendall assumed they'd pass starboard to starboard. At or around 1.45, as was the case earlier in the night, another bank of fog drifted its way across the St. Lawrence River, obscuring both ships as they steamed towards one another. The vessels both entered the fog at a good clip, both thinking they were well out of the way of another and passing at a good angle. Captain Kendall, aboard the Empress of Ireland, still found it a prudent idea to stop the ship, ordering the vessel into all back full to slow her down. He signaled this by sounding three short blasts on the ship's whistle. Simultaneously, Chief Officer Toftens, on the store stud, came to a similar conclusion of action, ordering his ship to all stop. He was certain the large liner would pass to his port, but to be safe he wanted to check his speed until the fog passed by. Tense moments passed by as both ships slowed to a crawl within the fog. The Empress of Ireland came to a full stop before taking her throttle to the all stop and holding her position. She signaled this with two prolonged blasts, indicating she was underway, not making way. But while the ships may be stopped, water is seldom immobile. The St. Lawrence had two knots of current. Toftens was worried that the heavy collier may drift into the path of the approaching liner simply by current alone. He ordered the ship ahead and ordered the helmsman to port his helm and turn to starboard. He believed the Empress to still be passing on his port side. He called down to the captain's cabin where Captain Thomas Anderson was half-dressed, trying to figure out why the vessel was stopped. He reported a light haze. As the Storstad came ahead, the ship signaled one prolonged blast. As Captain Anderson arrived on the bridge, visibility cleared, and there, outside the bridge window, perhaps two ship's lengths away and full broadside to the collier, was the huge Empress of Ireland, sitting motionless and directly in their path. Captain Anderson hollered for the Storstad to be thrown in reverse, signaling three short blasts. Captain Kendall had poked his head into the chart room for a moment. Looking out his starboard bridge window as he heard the whistle signals, he saw the Norwegian collier barreling down at him at an alarming rate of speed. He ordered the engines full ahead in a vain attempt to get out of the coal steamer's way, but it was far too little, far too late. There was no way for the massive ocean liner to go from stop to full speed ahead in such a short span of time. The ships were nearly perpendicular to one another, the collier looking like it would strike the starboard quarter of the Empress. Kendall ordered the helm hard aport, hoping to kick the stern of the ship to port and lessen the severity of the impending collision. But it wasn't enough. At around 01.55 a.m., the Storstad slammed bow first into the starboard side of the Empress of Ireland, nearly at a 90 degree angle in between the two funnels. The bow of the Storstad was a reinforced chisel-shaped design. This, combined with a longitudinally reinforced hull, allowed the ship to break ice in the often cold seas around Norway. But it also caused the ship to be akin to a battering ram. As the weighed down collier rammed broadside in the ocean liner, she caused massive amounts of damage to the ship at or below the waterline, entering her side like a knife. Captain Kendall knew the ship was in trouble the moment they struck each other. He yelled over a megaphone for Storstad to pin her engines forward to keep the steamer pressed into the hole it had made in the side of the ocean liner. The idea being similar to why one doesn't simply pull a knife from a wound. As long as the store stud stayed in the hole, the inflow of water would be restricted. But unfortunately, the momentum of the Empress was too great. The collier was pulled from the collision hole after barely a few seconds as the two ships drifted apart. The commotion of the multiple sound signals at the time had woken a few of the passengers and crew on board. But what awoke even more was the shock of the collision that reverberated through the vessel. The scream of steel puncturing steel, and the sound of the smaller ship bumping along the hull as they passed. Those that weren't awoken by that 
likely would never awaken again, or at least not until their cabins were suddenly inundated with icy water of the St. Lawrence. The hole put into the side of the Empress was around 25 feet high and 14 feet wide, so around 350 square feet or 32 square meters. Water flooded into the side at an estimated 60,000 gallons per second. As the Storstad twisted and pulled out of the Empress, she was left with a memento, the upper deck cabin door of cabin 328, one of the first class cabins on the Empress of Ireland. The collision was also in line with the ship's boilers and engine room. Captain Kendall knew the only way he could save his ship at the time was to turn her south and run her up on the southern shore. He ordered full speed ahead, calling the chief engineer on the ship's phone system, ordering him to give her all you can. But the boilers were snuffed out shortly after. The ship went dead in the water almost immediately, cold water rushing into the engine room at a terrifying rate. The snuffing out of the ship's fires resigned the fate of the Empress of Ireland. She would sink, and Captain Kendall knew this immediately. He stated, the ship is gone, women to the boats. With the boilers out, the ship was nearly instantly cast into darkness. Water flooded into the lower decks at a terrifying rate. Those in steerage and third class had scarcely a chance to know what had become of the ship before they were drowned in their berths, caught completely off guard by an inrush of seawater. Cast in darkness and unable to hear the cacophony of whistle signals, one can only imagine the horrifying final moments that the steerage and third class passengers experienced in the end. Awoken from a sleep by the flooding of their cramped berths on the bottom of the ship. It's little surprise that these passengers accounted for more than half of the total dead on the Empress of Ireland. The ship began to take on a heavy starboard list. The 22 stewards assigned to close the transverse watertight doors tried in vain to get to their assigned stations to close the doors in time. But the rapid inrush of water and the developing list made that task nigh impossible. A few died attempting to do just this, drowning in a vain attempt to save the ship. Two Marconi operators scrambled to send out a message almost as soon as the vessel was struck, furiously tapping out a distress message to the station at Father Point, likely saving many lives as the station relayed the message and got boats moving in for the rescue. Crew members scrambled to ready lifeboats for evacuation. On the starboard side, boats 1, 3, and 5 were made ready with the assistance of Captain Kendall who had run down to throw off the canvas of the boats almost immediately after the collision. On the port side, boat 8 was almost made ready to launch when the rapidly developing list became too great. Even if the boat was brought to the side, she'd have simply sat on the side of the listing empress. Below decks, bedlam and panic ensued. Any semblance of a tidy and efficient evacuation evaporated as the lights went out and the ship began to noticeably list to starboard. Choke points like ladder wells became tangled crushes of bodies, trying in vain to reach the perceived safety of the upper decks. Most clad in nothing more than night clothing or sleepwear, those who took the time to attempt to dress in appropriate attire likely never made it out. A well-prepared survivor of the Empress of Ireland was either a crewman up on watch or a passenger in pajamas and wearing a life belt. Water began to flood down the ladder wells as it began to flow in through the open portholes on the starboard side of the ship only further hastening the capsizing of the ship. Passengers attempting to escape were now forced to walk on the bulkheads of the ship as they continued their treacherous trek topside. On the upper decks, the portside lifeboats were abandoned, now entirely worthless, one even coming loose from its cradle, killing several as it plummeted across the decks into the sea below. A total of only six lifeboats from the starboard side were launched. The sixth was capsized in the process. Only 10 minutes after the collision, the Empress of Ireland was fully on her side. Passengers scrambled onto her side as she bobbed there for a few minutes, some scrambling out of portholes in the side like rats fleeing a flood. There were scant few boats in the water at the time. The prospect of leaping into the cold St. Lawrence River was a grim one. Surviving in the frigid water with a life belt was slim. Without one was nearly suicide. At exactly 2.10 a.m., 14 minutes after the Storstad collided with her, the Empress of Ireland disappeared beneath the black cold waters of the St. Lawrence. She took countless hundreds with her. Dozens bobbed helplessly in the cold water, still attempting to piece together what had just occurred in the blink of an eye. The response to the disaster was immediate, but scarcely enough. 
The vessel that had brought the mail to the Empress of Ireland, the government steamer, the Eureka, immediately set out to enact a rescue. She was followed shortly by the Lady Evelyn. But they weren't the first to provide assistance at the scene. This was in fact the Storstad, the ship that had laid the mortal blow. After Captain Anderson determined his own ship would not sink as well, he lowered all his lifeboats. Two boats from the Empress arrived, depositing their survivors before going out for another trip to rescue more. In total that night, the Storstad would rescue 250 survivors. But as passengers and crew were plucked from the frigid waters, their fight was far from over. Many were brought onto lifeboats or even carried onto steamers, only to silently fall unconscious and pass away from hypothermia shortly afterwards. Some 22 survivors ended up dying from injuries and exposure hours after being rescued. After a time, no more survivors were found, only bodies. The responding ships dutifully collecting as many of the dead as could be found. They would later bring them to be identified in Ramowski, the small town inundated with hundreds of dead. The death toll was staggering. Of the nearly 1,500 souls aboard, only 465 survived. Other than the steerage and third class passengers, the other demographic heavily hit by this were that of children. Of the 138 children on board, only four survived. The women didn't fare much better. Of the 310 on board, only 41 survived. The public the world over were stunned by this. How could a tragedy of this magnitude occur just two years after the cataclysmic loss of the RMS Titanic? Weren't regulations passed to prevent such a disaster? Had the legacy of the Titanic been for nothing? A tribunal was convened to attempt to find who was at blame here. The famous Lord Mercy headed the inquiry. The man that was in charge of the Titanic inquiry, then later the one over the Lusitania. The first thing noticeable from the accounts of the two captains were the inconsistencies in each other's stories. As was noted, if the testimony of both captains were to be believed, the collision happened as both vessels were stationary with their engines stopped. But after a good bit of back and forth, ultimately the blame was laid upon the Storstad and their captain. The reasoning being very simple. While the vessels were in restricted visibility, and while both vessels knew the other was four of their beam, the Storstad came ahead and turned to starboard. This change of course was not in standing with good seamanship and likely put the vessel on its final collision course. The Norwegian company was laid with a hefty toll to pay back to CPR, to which they of course protested and appealed, but again they were found at fault. In total they were charged with two million dollars. The Norwegian company countered sued for fifty thousand dollars, which of course failed. They ended up having the Storstad seized to help pay for the claim. Captain Kendall survived his harrowing ordeal, Thrown into the sea from the bridge as the boat turned over, he was promptly picked up in a lifeboat. He would later go on to serve in the Great War as a captain of the SS Montrose and later the HMS Calgarian, the latter of which was torpedoed and sunk by the German U-boat U-19. He survived this as well and went on to live a very long life, dying in 1965 in an English nursing home at the age of 91. The RMS Empress of Ireland is an interesting story of a vessel sometimes called the Forgotten Empress. A disaster that rivaled the Titanic in its devastation, but is seldom remembered in comparison. Perhaps the outbreak of the Great War just a few short months later overshadowed it. Or perhaps the swift and violent nature of the ship's death causes it to be less romantic and dramatic, as the Titanic is often portrayed. But the Empress of Ireland being the worst maritime disaster in Canadian history makes it deserving to be remembered. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Maritime Horrors. I hope you found it educational. I definitely found this one to be a very intriguing topic that I actually didn't know much about going into it. I'd like to thank my patrons, but I'd like to specifically thank Charlie and Todd Mills. Charlie contacted me on Patreon and told me that her husband, Todd, is a wounded warrior and a big fan of my channel. I just want to thank her and thank Todd personally. It makes me feel great knowing my content can help out a brave individual like Todd. So Todd, thank you warrior. Semper paratus. I'd also like to thank my channel artist. She took on 
She took one of my asinine ideas and made it a real thing. She designed my new Maritime Horrors radar display shirt, and I freaking love it. We spent way too much time working on this thing, put too much detail into it, but man do I think it's worth it. All my designs and the channel morale patches are linked in the description. But I hope you enjoyed my video, stay tuned for more, and fair winds and following seas to you shipmates.